On today's episode of the Harrison Vapnik Podcast, we're bringing on from the Boston Globe, Ben Volan, longtime Patriots reporter there, going to talk about the Patriots strategy this offseason, players they should and will target as a foreshadow to what they actually did this past week, going to talk about Patriots draft strategy, who they should look for, Mac Jones, Trey Lance, maybe even trading back in the draft, and also what it's been like covering the New England Patriots through their dynasty of the past decade, so a lot of fun stuff coming up with Ben Volan starting right Right now. Joined by from the Boston Globe, formerly of the Palm Beach Post, a graduate from Emory and the University of Florida. Not sure how we feel about that. Ben Volan from the Boston Globe. Ben, how are we doing today? Good, Harrison. Thanks for having me. Not a Florida fan, huh? Uh, when you come from a family that roots for the University of Miami, uh, you know, you, root, you don't usually root for the Gators. That's not usually in our blood. No, Canes and Gators. That, that's a good rivalry that they, they don't get on the field too often because that's a, that's a nasty rivalry. Usually some it, fights break out every time. It, it's been fun the few times they've played in my lifetime, but uh, it's, it, I wish they played every year like they used to in the past. I'm going to start with this because I'm not sure you remember this. I would assume you don't. In November of 2016, when the Patriots played at San Francisco, the 49ers, I, I traveled uh, out west to San Francisco for that game. I saw on Twitter, you tweeted, you were at the, like, a picture of, I guess, looking off on the coast, where I would say it was like the Argonaut Hotel, something around there. And I saw you tweet the picture. It looked basically exactly where I was. I tweeted at you. I was like, hey, I look at the area. I'm staying here at the Argonaut. You know, let me know if you're around or something. And you replied. You're like, oh, I'll let you know where I'm getting drinks later. And I'm like, (laughs) I was 15 years old at the time. I'm telling my my mom, I'm like, oh, Ben Bullen wants to go for drinks later. She couldn't understand. And I was like, we never (laughs) ended up getting drinks. But I'm not sure you remember that, but. For, for the record, sorry. I did not intentionally mean to serve a minor that was uh, no, no, not aware that you were 15 years old. That's pretty funny. Okay, uh, let's let's get to some more serious stuff. Um, free agency starting this week. New England Patriots, 65 million in cap. It's the most thing they've ever had in my lifetime. That's coming off a seven and nine season, the first losing record since 2000. Are the Patriots going to swing for the fences in free agency, Ben? I'm still a little skeptical about swing for the fences. Like, I don't think they're going to go out and get Hunter, Hunter Henry and Kenny Galladay and, you know, spend all the money on the fantasy football players that like a lot of the fans want. And it would be fun if they did that, but there would not be. And I mean, Belichick does that once in a while, like with Stefan Gilmore. I mean, he, he kind of surprised everyone with that move. Um, but I think he also views cornerback as a more um, important position than like wide receiver. Uh, I do think they're going to be moves, but I, you know, I, I think I have a feeling the Patri- Patriots are going to be patient because there are going to be a lot of quality football players available this year. And it's going to be a slow market just because the pandemic um, has affected the salary cap by, you know, decreasing it by 15 million this year. You have, all, you know, all these teams have other than the Patriots and a couple other teams, all these other teams have, you know, very little money to spend and they're, cutting and restructuring guys and there are a lot of quality football players available so there's there's good talent available and there might not be a need to sign a 15 million dollar receiver when there might be some good options available you know beyond just march 5th march 17th but throughout the next couple of months and there's going to be trades obviously um so you know i think the patriots uh you know look they have a they have a lot of cap space, but they have a lot of needs as well. They have a lot of their own free agents, two running backs, uh, James White and Rex Burkhead, um, Joe Tooney, the left guard, you know, whether he stays or goes, that has kind of a cascade effect. Both their defensive tackles, Lawrence Guy and Adam Butler. Um, you know, uh, what are they going to do with Stephon Gilmore? What are they going to do with Jonathan um, JC Jackson, who is a restricted free agent? Um, so they're, they're just, there's a lot of holes and of course, well, they, they, they filled one of their holes with Cam Newton, but I don't think they're, you know, done at quarterback either. So, um, you know, I think a lot of free agency is going to be re-signing some of their own guys like the James Whites and, and Lawrence guys and, and things of that nature. And, um, you know, I, I want them to go get like a Juju Smith Schuster. I think he'd be a great fit, but I just think there are a lot of teams that are going to be going for the, the top wide receivers and, 
you know, maybe Patriots fans should temper their expectations a little bit because this is a team that usually doesn't, you know, overspend for the big offensive weapon. And they're going to be a lot of teams out there going for these guys. Um, so that's kind of my thoughts on the Patriots free agency. Yeah. The interesting is because the pandemic and ironically, just not a lot of teams have salary cap this year of like the 10 teams that do have some kind of money or like eight of them are in the AFC, which makes it weird. But, you know, Belichick's always trying to find, you know, strategies with the play clock or the rule book. Now, now all of a sudden he has all this money and, you know, if, for the really the first time in a while. And the question of is if he's going to spend it all, the issue has been about the weapons for, I guess, since the later half of the Patriots dynasty, I would say since the 2017 season when they had, you know, Cooks and they had Edelman to start the year and Gronk and Amendola and Hogan. Now it's, you know, they're sending out guys like Nikhil Harry and Jacoby Myers and guys like who've really not been consistent the last couple of years, Demir Bird. The wide receiver has been and tight end have been the number one issue for all Patriots fans and I guess, coaches and players, they've all acknowledged that the receivers has been the team's weakness for the last two seasons. Which guys do you think, because you don't think they're going to make a splash, a guy like Juju or Galladay, who are some of the guys that you think they'll go after? Um, I mean, it's kind of throwing darts, so it's a little tough uh, to gauge exactly where they're going. The guy, when I look at the list of receivers, I mean, first of all, Juju would be great. It's just, I, I think for the price tag, I don't know if the Patriots are going to go there. And same with like Curtis Samuel, who, I think has like the versatility that the Patriots yeah. would love. He plays receiver. He can go inside and outside. He can play some running back. Um, he can return kicks for you. So the Patriots do love that versatility, but I just, I don't know. I get, get the feeling that guys like that are going to get a lot of offers and, and a lot of money on the, on the free agency market. Um, <laughs> you know, I get, I get killed for, you know, coming up with these names. Cause again, fans don't like it when you go value and you go cheap, but I don't know the guy that stands out to me, Someone who could be an interesting fit would be uh, Keelan Cole, who was a receiver for the Jaguars the last few years. Uh, has had some good productive, you know, numbers playing in an offense with, you know, not many great quarterbacks and, you know, former undrafted guy who's worked hard and, and come on in the scene. And uh, a few years ago when they played the Patriots early in the he season. Had, he had the one-handed catch. Is that the right guy? You know, 116 yards and a touchdown yeah. against the Patriots, you know, which doesn't mean – that doesn't mean they should sign him, but they've seen up close that, you know, he's, he can play and – I don't think a guy like him is going to break the bank. So like, I don't know, to me, a guy like that makes a little more sense, um, you know, than Kenny Galladay, who I don't know if he even wants to come here and play for Matt Patricia again. Okay. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm, the, the more intriguing position is kind of tight end because, you know, in theory, the two draft picks that should kind of take care of the position. Ozzy Ozzy and, and Dalton Keene both taken the third round last year. You know, it's probably too early to give up on guys like that. You'd like to see them take a nice big step forward this year, but at the same time, got to you got to give them more help too um so i don't know if it's johnny smith and hunter henry the two big tight ends uh that are going to be available on the market there's a guy from uh arizona um is it dan, dan, dan arnold? arnold dan arnold that's the yeah. name thank you uh he's intriguing you know six six really athletic uh made some plays last year i think caught four touchdowns for, for the cardinals and again a guy that won't break the bank so you know they like those guys with like matt lacoste you know, kind of the value. And, and I understand that you look at like Hunter Henry and Johnny Smith, you know, they're going to be getting 12, 13, $14 million in the open market. And like Hunter Henry has injury history and he's never gone for even 700 yards before. And some of the production, it, it does worry you a little bit for what, what you're going to be paying for. Um, you know, that's the thing with free agency, you're always overpaying and that's not what the Patriots generally like to do. Um, and it, and it's worked well for them. You know, obviously they had Tom Brady that could cover up a lot of their warts over the years, but um, I, you know, I, I still, I still give Belichick certainly the benefit of the doubt when it comes to roster building. And um, you know, even last year they had the worst roster in the league, you know, certainly on offense yeah. and they still won seven games. So uh, you know, it, it, sometimes the roster doesn't look great. It's, it's not a big fantasy football roster, but um, Belichick generally knows how to build depth and, and the most important positions to build out. So, um, but this is a big off season for him. And especially with Brady winning the Super Bowl in Tampa, like, you know, seven and nine is not going to cut it. Probably having Cam Newton, you know, as the only question starter, that's not going to cut it. They got to do something big at quarterback, whether it's, you know, in the draft or trading for Jimmy G, something like that. So the pressure is definitely on Belichick, but I, I still believe in him that he can get this thing right and get the Patriots back on track. Let's transition that to the quarterback position. They just signed Cam Noon to a, a $5 million base salary extension last week. They have a chance to, you know, improve at the quarterback position. 
uh, if that's you, the number 15 pick in the draft. You mentioned the Jimmy Garoppolo trade. Is a trade for a quarterback pre-draft in the realm of possibilities for New England? I mean, I think so in theory. Nothing about bringing Cam Newton on will preclude them from doing anything at quarterback. Um, you look at Cam's contract, it, it's only, you know, it's up to 13.6, but only three and a half million is guaranteed. And even then his one and a half million base salary is subject to offset. So if they were to like trade him, they would be, you know, relieved of that obligation or if they caught him and he signed with another team, whatever he made from another team, they would be, so they could be on the hook for just 2 million for Cam Newton potentially, which is, you know, nothing in the NFL these days. So if Jimmy, like to me, they signed Cam because it's clear right now that Jimmy's not available, but if he were to become available, like he's the guy, I mean, he knows your system. Belichick loves him. He's, when he's healthy, he's productive. You know, the, the durability is what the big issue is with him. And so you'd have to prepare yourself for that. You'd have to have a good backup situation. But um, if Jimmy does become available, I think nothing they've done with Cam will preclude them from going to get Jimmy. Certainly, you know, if they don't get Garoppolo, I don't, I don't really see anyone else out there. I mean, yeah, Russell Wilson and Deshaun Watson, but I don't think that's unlikely. Yeah, realistic for the Patriots. So, um, you know, it's to me, it's, the only trade would be Garoppolo. I'm not a Marcus Mariota guy. I don't, I don't think the Definitely. Patriots would would be either. And I mean, the guy I wanted was Ryan Fitzpatrick. I, I think he's like the greatest bridge quarterback mentor for the young guy. But I, under, you know, he probably didn't want to sign right now, and the Patriots had to have a quarterback going into free agency. And Cam's like, yeah, I'll sign whatever you want. Like, let's do it. So I, I think that's what. But they have to if they. If they don't do anything else you know, right now, they have to first round, second round, somewhere in the top 50, you know, 75 picks of the draft. They've got to find a quarterback. Do you, your thoughts on Cam Newton's first season up and down first three games were pretty good at the wins against Miami and Vegas, the close loss to Seattle gets COVID misses the chiefs game comes back was awful against Denver, not great against San Francisco. I think he was benched for Stidham in that game. Not great against Buffalo, and then kind of the season went off the rails before they finished seven and nine. Do you have expectations that if Cam is a starter come week one next season, that he will be better? If it's well, yeah, I think I give Cam the benefit of the doubt. Like, look, we all um, we all saw it last year. He really struggles to push the ball downfield. They had no, you know, big play passing attack by any you know by any stretch, and he struggled to see the fields. Um, it was one of the worst passing attacks in the NFL, you know, that said, I think Cam does some things though, that you can still win with Cam and he was great, you know, as a rusher, which I don't think should be undersold. They were fantastic on third downs, third and short, any short yardage situation, usually, you know, for the most part on the goal line, say for that, you know, Seattle game. And I think the LA Rams, he also maybe got stuffed, yeah. but um, for the most part, he was very efficient and yeah, like, um, with his circumstances, if, if, if this were Brady, we'd be making excuses for him up and down, you know, he, no off season, no training camp, you know, no preseason, a COVID year, learning a new playbook, new teammates, arguably the worst, um, you know, set of weapons around him in the NFL. Then he got COVID like so many things kind of working against him and they still went seven and eight. I mean, they deserve to be that record, but they're not that far off. And so, yeah, if you gave Cam another year, built up the pieces a little bit better around him, I don't see any reason why you can't go, well, you know, assuming a 17 game schedule, why you can't go nine and eight, 10 and seven, you know, make the playoffs. I don't think they're a contender, but you can win games with Cam and you can, you know, keep the team going while you develop the, the young kid that you hopefully draft as well. I mean, clearly that kid is going to be the future and that's what you want the Patriots to do, but you don't want them to rush the young quarterback into the game. And Belichick definitely won't just hand a quarterback job to a youngster. And it's definitely going to whoever, if they do draft someone, it's going to be in their best interest to let them sit for a year or whatever. So Cam is fine. I wanted Fitzpatrick. I thought Fitzy would be better, especially in the passing game, but I understand the continuity aspect. He knows the playbook. He knows the guys, um, you know, he's kind of already a leader in the locker room. They, everyone seemed to, you know, be happy that he was resigned. So I know it's not very popular with the fans, um, but you can win with Cam. And, you know, ideally he's really just keeping the seat warm until whoever you draft, you know, is going to be ready to start. 
The win thing you mentioned, they were 7-19 and last year, but they lost the game to Seattle. They were one yard away. The game against Denver, the defense gives up zero touchdowns. They played a pretty good game and had a chance, a position to win the game at the end. The Buffalo game, they were right there at the end. Even the Miami game in week 15, I think the defense held Miami to like one touchdown in that game. They were they, – couple things go differently they're 10 and 16 last year and maybe playing on wild card weekend so i don't think they're super far off back to the free agency thing for a second there are a lot of guys you mentioned players in free agency who do you think they should prioritize in the guys like james white and tooney who it just came out a couple hours ago that new england they're talking to him again with contract after it looks like he was gone after the trent brown trade some of the guys who are free agents right now you mentioned lawrence guy adam butler who are the guys you think they're going to prioritize and sign yeah it's a good question um you know, Tooney's interesting. Uh, it, it On the surface, it wouldn't make sense to splurge on a guy like him. But, I mean, Belichick believes very deeply and correctly that the offensive line is, you know, probably the most important thing on the offense uh, other than quarterback and maybe even equal with quarterback. Yeah. And I didn't think they would franchise Tooney last year. So, uh, who knows? We'll see. But I also did I, – I did hear prior to the Trent Brown – trade that they were talking to some of the left tackles on in free agency and talking about moving Isaiah Wynn to left guard. So, um, I, you know, I, I still expect Tooney to get some huge offer and the Patriots to not match it. Um, and I'd be okay with that. I don't, you know, Tooney's a great player, but I don't know if investing all that money into a guard is really the best use of your assets. Um, James White, I would bring back for another year, but they should also, you know, draft another one of the, you know, they, like, I remember, they had Shane Vereen, but they drafted James White and they redshirted him for a year, basically, because that pat the pass catching role, uh, you know, running back in, in the offense, um, that, that's a complicated role. And so that be good if they drafted someone to kind of learn from James White, because he, you know, I, I understand he had some difficult circumstances off the field, but, you know, he also had a pretty disappointing year last year and he's like 29. So it's time to, you know, and Rex Burkhead's coming off a devastating knee injury as well. So I, you know, I would bring back James White, but only maybe for a year, and I'd start to think of the future. Uh, Lawrence Guy is definitely someone I would bring back, a very consistent, um, probably their most consistent player in the front seven, great against the run, solid in, in pass rush, move him different parts of the defensive line. Adam Butler, I'm more in wait and see mode. If he gets, you know, wants to come back or, you know, doesn't get crazy deals in free agency, I would bring both those guys back, but I think Guy is the more important of the two and maybe it has a little bit better value of the two. Um, Demir Bird's another guy I would bring back. I mean, I'm not assuming he's going to get any sort of offers. He played a ton of snaps for them last year. He had of all their offensive skill guys, he had the most snaps on the Patriots last year, like 90%. So, um, you know, he's got some speed and he can be your third or fourth option. And like, why not? He won't break the bank. Um, trying to think uh, G- the, the real interesting one, that I don't think people are talking about enough is JC Jackson. Yeah. Uh, well, this guy was seven, seven, seven picks. So, uh, well, it's 17 picks in three seasons. And he had, he had nine last year and he's a restricted free agent. And so we'll kind of, we'll see how the Patriots feel about him by the level of tender that they put on him. If they put a first round tender on him, which would not be unreasonable, it would give him a salary of, I think, 4.7 million somewhere in there. And he'd be back. I mean, no team, probably no team is going to give up their first round pick and sign JC Jackson to some big free agent contract. But if they give a second round tender, I could see him getting some action in free agency. It's a weak year in the draft for cornerbacks. And um, you know, you, if, if you're a team and you think you're close and you need a corner, I mean, a 25 year old kid with, with three years experience is, you know, that's right in your wheelhouse. So if the Patriots put a second round tender on JC Jackson, and we should know within the next few days, that'll be a sign that they're really, kind of hoping that he gets the the big offer out there and they I think would gladly take a second round pick for him so that'll be a really interesting decision for them to watch do you think they'd risk losing JCG he's been absolutely awesome for them in the last three seasons you mentioned the 17 picks since the 2018 season you think even they would get a second rounder back you think they'd risk that because I know Belichick doesn't like to break the bank for those guys but you know with defensive backs it's different because he brought in Revis he brought in Gilmore uh Ty Law he had early on and he doesn't think that JC Jackson can be you know the next face of the England Patriots secondary because you know if they do give up a second round pick they do get a second round pick back for him is it worth it because of how good he's been I think he's been a very good player. Don't get me wrong, but I do think he's been uh, overinflated by his interception numbers a little bit. I don't think, you know, on a pure, like, you know, 
snap to snap basis if he's a truly dominant cornerback. I think he's a very good number two, but uh, you know, towards the end of the season when Gilmore missed some time, I mean, we kind of we you see the difference between a number one and Gilmore and uh, a number two like J.C. Jackson. And, and so, like you know, next year he'll be a free agent and let if he leaves in free agency as an unrestricted guy next year, then you're getting a third round compensatory pick the year after that. And maybe not now you're getting a second round pick right away. So yeah, it does throw your secondary in flux a little bit, um, but they have some depth there. You know, it, it might also depend on what happens with Stefan Gilmore, whether they look to extend him or look to trade him. I do think something's going to happen with Gilmore because of his contract situation. He's not going to play for a 50% pay cut this year. Mm-hmm. So they're going to decide, but you know, so maybe they decide Gilmore, he's only 31. I mean, we assume they're going to trade him, but maybe he's got two or three more good years left and they take the second round pick for JC Jackson instead. Um, so a lot, I think a lot of balls up in the air, but I don't think they see it the way that you just said it as he's like the future of the team. I, you know, I think he's kind of like the next Malcolm Butler. Like he was an undrafted guy. They developed him. He became a good asset. And then when it's time to get paid, you know, thank you for your service, which, ha- which happens to a lot of guys. In it, it, it happens. It happens to almost everybody, unless you're, you know, Tom Brady or Gronk. To the they've brought it back, Trent Brown. There are a lot of guys in the market who are former Patriots that they've had some interest in bringing back guys like Malcolm Butler. You just mentioned Ron Harmon, Kyle Van Noy, Malcolm Brown, Ted Karras, and then some other guys like maybe Adam Humphreys or Kyle Rudolph who they've targeted in the past. That's come out. Do you see any of those guys making a return back to New England this season? Yeah, potentially Kyle Van Noy. I could see the Patriots, you know, wanting to uh, add another veteran, you know, a presence to the to the defense, to the linebacker unit, to the front seven. You know, that said, I want them to go young on defense and just in general, like just getting the band back together just doesn't sound like a sa- a good plan. You know, like it's just temporary fixes. I want them to like draft and develop and, and get their own guys, uh, you know, through the system and get some young talent. They need more athleticism in the front seven. Uh, I thought their game against Deshaun Watson last year made that very clear where they just could not contain yeah. it at all. Um, so, you know, maybe Karras is a backup option if uh, they don't re-sign David Andrews. But, you know, that was a guy I should have mentioned before. David Andrews is yeah. absolutely essential, I think, to bring back. Got You know, center is such an important piece, especially in this offense. And uh, so that's a guy. So, um you know, like Malcolm Butler, I'm going to guess probably not coming back, uh, you know, given his history. Like Danny Amendola, probably not coming back, given some of the things that he said against the Patriots. Uh, who, who are some of those other names you mentioned real quick? Deron, Deron Harmon, Van Noy, uh, and then Malcolm Brown are the others. Yeah, like maybe Malcolm Brown if they lose Adam Butler. You know, just like a value signing, you know, barely, probably barely more than the league minimum with maybe some incentives. Um, I think Van Noy's going to have a market, so we'll see. Um, so do I. So we'll see, but you know, I, I don't want them to just get all, you know, sign all the old familiar names again, like have more, have a little more creativity than that, have a better plan than that and go out and get some youth. And, you know, if they sign free agents, I want them to be the 25, 26 year old free agents, not the 31 year old guys. Yeah. You mentioned the Malcolm Butler thing. I, I wanted to ask you this is, well, why was he mentioned in Super Bowl 52? Do you, do you have any idea? I know no one has the answer for this. You have just any speculation or any idea of why he didn't play in this game? Yeah, I mean, that's the million-dollar question, and trust me, if I knew, like, the world would know it. I wouldn't be sitting yeah. on it. But um, my hunch is – I don't think it was a singular incident. I know there are lots of rumors, like, he punched this guy and he got caught with this and broke yeah. curfew. Yeah, I think if it was a singular incident, that would have come out. Um, and and I've, I've become close with some people in Butler's camp, and, you know, maybe they're all great actors or whatever, but no one seems to truly – know what happened I I think it was Butler kind of said it himself when he signed with the Titans a few years ago and I think what he said is probably true I mean he he was a free agent you know all like coming you know an impending free agent all season it definitely messed with his head and he admitted that and he had a very inconsistent season and didn't play great and I think had a probably had a terrible week of practice in the Super Bowl and then missed the team flight because he was sick and Bill was like, screw this. I'm, I'm demoting the kid. Like we can't, I can't take this, you know, um, you know, I can't trust this kid anymore. And so he basically just like demoted him to the Johnson Batamosi role, which would be the fourth corner and the gunner on the punter team. And he, and he moved everyone else up the depth chart. And just that number just never got called during the game, just, you know, personnel and, you know, neither team punted. 
Um, now I don't blame we, you know, Belichick's never explained it. And I don't think, I, I don't think it's as easy to say, well, if Malcolm plays, we would have won. I mean, who oh. knows, but I, and I don't, so I don't blame Belichick for benching Butler to not to start the game, but I do blame him for not making the adjustment in the second half when they're just getting torched by Nick Foles and Johnson Batamosi and Jordan Richards are the ones missing tackles and Butler sitting there on the sideline. So that's, that's the mistake that Belichick and the Patriots made was they were the king of, of mid game adjustments and for whatever reason, they just did not go to Malcolm Butler, who had played 98% of the snaps up to that point. They trusted him all the way up until the end and then, you know, refused to play him. Yeah, it's – my I theory is just he, he wasn't playing – I think he wasn't playing well against the Titans. I think Corey Davis scored two touchdowns on him in that game. He wasn't good against Jackson. He just wasn't playing well. And you mentioned the bad week of practice. And then you throw Bad Mosey and Richards and Eric Rowe out there. And, you know, Nick Foles did the rest. Back to the draft and the more, more – positive note pages of the 15th pick in the draft are highest and quite I can't even think of the last time they're picked in the top 15 even when trading up do you expect them to go quarterback do you think they go front seven receiver tight end what direction are you hearing the, they're, they're going to go in uh yeah the last time they had a pick this high was uh Gerard Mayo in 2008 yeah. I think it was the number 10 pick that they got in a trade with the Niners um and yeah so it's the first time you know, they're picking this high organically since like the 2001 draft probably. Yep. Um, so uh, I don't think they take a quarterback in the first round. I don't think they're going to trade up for any of these guys. I don't think they believe in Mac Jones. Um, you know, if they could get Justin Fields, I think they would love it, but I just don't think they're going to be able to trade up to like number four in the draft. 15 is kind of no man's land when it comes to the quarterbacks there in the first round. Um, if a quarterback did fall to them, you got to be wary. That means a lot of teams pass over on the kid. And it's just not quite good enough of a pick to get really high up. You have to give up a lot. And that just doesn't seem Belichick's MO. So I, I think they wait until the second or the third round and they get, you know, Kellen Mond from Texas A&M or the kid from Stanford. I forget his name, but I know everyone, like I've heard, I've heard him mentioned a few times, pro style offense, Stanford smart. And that makes more sense, much more cost effective, um, no, pr much less pressure to like play right away and to have expectations. Jimmy Garoppolo is the 60, 62nd pick, you know, like that's, that's a good wheelhouse. Like, you know, and, and while certainly the most talented quarterback comes in the first round, um, there are a graveyard of misses in the first round as well. And plenty of guys like Russell Wilson, Kirk Cousins, Jimmy Garoppolo, plenty of guys that have been found in the middle round. So I think, you know, at 15, you're talking like a left tackle or a linebacker. Um, I know the kid from Penn State, everyone raised him. Parsons. He'll be available. Uh, there's that kid, Zavin Collins from Tulsa. He looks very intriguing. Uh, Bill loves defensive backs. Maybe he goes cornerback again, especially, you know, we'll see what happens with Gilmore and J.C. Jackson. So I think there will be value at 15, just not for quarterbacks. So I don't think that's where they go this year. Yeah, I'd be surprised to see them draft a quarterback. I, I'm the designated president of the Trey Lance fan club. I'd love to see them move up and get him, but I, I don't know how likely that is. In the later rounds after, they have one second. They have the third that they got in the compensatory. couple fourths. Is that going to be this? Is this going to be there? They get some skill guys there. Or they can continue to build the offensive and defensive line like Bill always does. Yeah, I wonder if the Nikhil Harry experience has spooked them on drafting receivers. Yeah. High. You know, that said, though, I mean, there's so many good receivers now being developed, and that's the one position where you, you should be able to plug and play those guys. You look at some of these teams like the Niners and the Steelers, like they just find guys and they get production out of them right away. So um, maybe Nikhil Harry was just, you know, a bad fit or whatever, but um, I don't, you know, like I don't think they draft tight end again after taking the two last year. Um, but, you know, otherwise, uh, I think they have enough holes and enough needs that you just fill your team with whatever, you, you know, the best players you have available there. And Yeah, they need receivers. They're going to need offensive linemen. They need a quarterback. Um, they need linebackers. They need, uh, you know, and like, you know, probably another safety, maybe not safety, but probably cornerback. So they're in a position where it's good in a way they can take best player available, but um, they do have a lot of holes and, and, you know, a good amount of rebuilding still to do. Yeah. And so back, back, let's go to the past. When you started the Boston Globe in 2013, really the spark of the Patriots second dynasty. What are some of your favorite memories from covering those last, you know, that 2013 to 2019 season where the Patriots were the best team in the NFL? Some of your best memories from that time. 
Yeah, pretty lucky that I got here uh, yeah. right, you know, right when they started winning again. And like, I hate to say this, but like Deflate Gate, I loved covering that story, um, getting to go to New York all the time and sitting, sitting in on like federal court and watching some of the, you know, former attorney generals of the United States, like arguing about ball deflation and whether Roger did I mean, the whole thing was so absurd. And uh, I, you know, like I'm a law and order dork. So I love like going to court. Like I, when am I ever going to get to cover a story like that again? I was really rooting for it to go to the Supreme Court of the United States. So like, I, you know, I know everyone hates deflate gate, but I love it. I thought it was a great story. Um, yeah. And the whole suspension, I mean, what a circus. I mean, and I got to go on sports center all the time. And I mean, Covering Deflategate was was good for business back in the day. Um, the Patriots, you know, they covering them. You get to go to so many cool things. Uh, all the Super Bowls. Um, not to not to uh, brag about it, but I do get to go to the Super Bowl every year. But the Patriots okay. Super Bowls are always the most epic. I mean, the Seahawks game, the Falcons game is the craziest football game I'll ever see. I mean, we'll never see an accomplishment like that again. Um, and just you know on deadline trying to put thoughts together while the greatest game in, in Super Bowl history is unfolding. That was, that was incredible. Um, a game in Mexico city was really cool. They played the Raiders down in Mexico city yeah. a few years ago. Um, that was a really fun weekend and um, eye opening in terms of what it's like down there, but also how big the NFL is in Mexico city. It's very popular and uh, I definitely you know expect them to continue that. So um, I guess off the top of the off, off the top of my head, those are between Deflategate, all the Super Bowls, and some of the fun trips like Mexico City. It's hard to top some of that. I vaguely remember you tweeting something in during Super Bowl Fifty One, the Falcons game, about the press box and like the energy in there. Uh, you probably know better than I do. What was what was that atmosphere like up there? If if I am correct, that you tweeted something about you know was the energy or something up in the press box in the fourth quarter and overtime that Super Bowl. I mean, I personally was kind of losing it because, like, you're just watching it. It's hard to watch this game and not be like, oh, my God, you know, like, holy bleep. I mean, it's hard to just <laughs> stay composed and, and you know. But at the same time, it was also kind of quiet because people are writing and, and ripping. Like, for me, you know, we're on these tight deadlines. You have to send your story in for, you know, like, second edition of the paper, like, right when the game ends. So you spend the fourth quarter writing and – when the game is 28 to nine, it's like, okay, Patriots lost. And boy, this is going to be a long off season. And then they start to come back and you have to rip up your story and you have to start rewriting and you're not quite sure which way it's going to go. And um, I think once Hightower got that strip sack, you're like, all right, it's on. And then, you know, Amendola converts the two point conversion. It's a tie game. And I think everyone realized at that point, which way the, the snowball was rolling down the hill. And so, you, but you know, you're just furiously writing. And it was similar for the Seahawks Super Bowl a couple years before excuse me, I remember uh, we're in Phoenix and the press box is, um, you know, pin drop quiet and uh, Malcolm Butler makes the interception. And all of a sudden one person in the press box goes bleep. Yeah. And you turn around, it was Bob Quinn. Uh, <laughs> who was then, you know, that later became the GM of the uh, Lions. He just, uh, he couldn't, couldn't help himself. It was such a big moment. Um, and he was the only one in the press box uh, talking. So, um, but yeah, usually it's like, and, and it was for Super Bowl 51, I, I, as it was happening, usually when a game changes like that, you just delete your story and you start over. But I was like, uh, save what you had because it'll only – it'll show, it'll personify how incredible this comeback was when it, they just look completely dead in the water and how, you know, things just gradually and, and quickly turn for them. Um, so it was cool. I, I, I kept what I wrote and I um, – ended up tweeting it out and like NFL a producer from NFL films saw it. They're like, that was such a cool idea. We want to like do a piece on that whole dynamic on having your story and then having to rewrite it and how crazy that night was. So they like did a 10 minute, like little short special. And I got to be like a featured part of it. So like, that was like probably one of the coolest things I've gotten to do uh, in my career. So uh, again, Super Bowl 51 was just incredible and we'll never see anything like that again. That's the greatest game in NFL history. The people who want to argue like it's like the Giants Patriots Super Bowl. That was there were like thirty one points in that game. It was like ten seven. I mean, that one, it was like seven. Yeah, you know, it's like seven three going to the fourth that quarter. Was pretty incredible too. But this one, yeah, yeah, I would put this one up there. Absolutely. Or like like the Colts Giants game, like nineteen fifty. Like okay, like that's not better than whatever happened in that game. But back to your career before you went Boston Globe. You before you were in the Palm Beach Post covering uh, the Miami Dolphins and Florida Gators for that. 
do you miss the South Florida weather and also always like covering uh, the, both the Dolphins and Gators? Yes, I, I'm definitely the only idiot who moves from Florida to Boston and not the other way around. Uh, I do love Boston, but uh, I miss the Florida winters for sure and living by the beach and uh, you get a nice big two-bedroom apartment for like no money and you know, all that stuff. But um, uh, it, was, uh, it was a different market for sure. Boston's much more intense and especially New England because it – you know, the Patriots are such a regional team. There's just so much media that covers them. Like I thought Miami was a big market. We had three newspapers and, you know, some TV stations and stuff, but it's just, it's a totally different animal here. Um, but it was a great experience covering the dolphins. I, you know, I started out, um, bef bef you know, covering not full time, but I would help out like covering the Nick Saban dolphins. And so yeah. like being around kind of a tougher coach like Nick Saban and then Bill Parcells came in and they were, tough to deal with. So that I think prepared me well for dealing with a guy like Belichick. Um, I covered some really bad Dolphins teams, the one in 15, yeah. team, 2007. Although when they beat the Ravens for their one win and it made them one 14, that was one of the best games I've ever covered. And that, that celebration was like, you know, 10 Super Bowls when they, you know, won, finally won a game. At that was a, that was an overtime if I'm not mistaken. It was a 64 yard walk off touchdown against the Ravens. And it, it, that was awesome. That was a really fun win and experience uh, in a game that, you know, meant nothing, but it meant everything. Um, so, you know, but, you know, it's, it's, it was a good experience to cover some bad teams because, you know, it stretches your uh, creativity a little bit. And, you know, it's hard when they're just losing week after week, you know, it challenges you to come up with some interesting material, but uh, it was, it was good in that sense. And then, I got to cover the Urban Meyer Florida Gators for two years, which was awesome. I got there for Tebow's junior and senior years. So they won a national title my first year there. And that was when Tebow made the promise speech after their loss to Ole Miss and all that. And, um, and then their senior year, they were number one the whole way, but then they lost to Alabama and Nick Saban in the AFC, uh, AFC in the uh, SEC championship game. And then went to the sugar bowl and kick some butt. And that was fun getting to spend a week in New Orleans at the sugar bowl. But yeah, Debo went to the Heisman every year and the Gators were always playing national TV games at LSU and South Carolina. And, um, you know, it was, it was just awesome. And they had, they were loaded with NFL talent, Percy Harvin, Joe Hayden, Carlos Dunlap, um, guys that didn't quite make it like Tebo, Brandon Spikes, um, Aaron Hernandez. How could I forget him? <laughs> Um, so that was just a wild time. And, you know, the SEC is awesome. And I always say the NFL is a, is a better product. It's the football is, is more enjoyable and, and more fun, but, uh, game day, the game day experience in the SEC just cannot be beat. And, you know, it's different. these fun college towns and a hundred thousand fans and the tailgating and just the way that everyone gets into it, college football, especially in the SEC, uh, is just really awesome. So I did that for two years and that was fun. And, you know, all that was just a good experience and a good build up for getting to this amazing experience with the globe uh, in 2013. It's now been eight years. It's kind of flown by, but um, uh, th those, it, you know, working down there was, it, it was competitive. It was fun. It was, you know, big, big time teams and I covered some bad teams as well. So it was, it was a really good experience. I'll get you on this. Your first time, because, you know, Nick Saban, not Nick Saban, Bill Belichick's a, a pretty tough guy to interview when you're doing it in a press conference or an interview. So the first time you had to talk to Coach Belichick, was there a nervous interaction? What, what, take me through that process. Um, I think I came in, you know, being like the tough guy, like I'm not going to get intimidated by Bill. And I don't, I don't think I tried to be like a hardo or anything and like asking super tough questions. But, um, you know, I came in in a weird time too, like, Aaron Hernandez have, got arrested a month after I got here. So just, you know, talk about getting thrown in the fire. And, um, and then a year after that, Deflategate happened. So just, you know, these big, weird stories happening. And overall, what I've learned from Belichick is, um, yeah, he acts, uh, he acts tough in press conferences and he can belittle you and, and things of that. And he can be very sarcastic, but it's a lot of it's an act. And he understands, I mean, he's been doing this for, decades he, he understands the role of the press and what he's going to be asked and um, I think he respects people who stand up to him and ask the tough questions and I have a good rapport with him we're cool um, I can get him not often but I'll, I'll get him off to the side every once in a while if I say hey I, if I you know tell the Patriots hey I want to ask him x y and z can I get him for five minutes like I'll, I'll get him once in a while and uh, 
he can be great when he wants to be. And he's very, you know, he's who better knows the game of football than this guy and the history of it and the I mean, he's incredible. So um, I think I have a good relationship with him. And, you know, sometimes I ask him questions he doesn't like, and I I don't think he minds the pushback. Um, I think a lot of it, you know, by him is for show. And uh, you know, I, I wish, uh, sometimes that they wouldn't be so difficult to cover, but in his parlance, you know, it is what it is. And, uh, even without their cooperation, they're still a very fascinating team to cover. So it's, um, that, you know, they're kind of like a writer's dream. They're interesting on the field. They're interesting off the field, lots of drama. So, you know, there's never a shortage of material uh, with these guys. It's a great storyline. Thank you, Ben, for coming on the Harris of Athletic Podcast and talking all things to the Patriots. You can read him daily on the Boston Globe. Also, you have a new show for NESN. Uh, for WEI. Um, WDI, um, yeah, that's it. Yeah, Saturdays at noon, the Ben Bolin Football Hour. And uh, yeah, please, if, if you can uh, read my work at bostonglobe.com and on Twitter at Ben Bolin. All right, thank you, Ben, for coming on. All right, thanks for having me. Huge thank you to Ben Bolin for coming on the podcast, talking all things New England Patriots. I think we got him a day too early before all the signings with Johnny Smith, Hunter Henry, Matt Judon, all of that. So really good conversation with Ben Bolin. Once again, thanks for Ben for coming on. Next up on the Harrison Vatnik podcast, we went a little bit out of order. We're going to have Jay Kyle Mann on from the ringer. We're going to talk all things NBA, midseason storylines, some of the rookies that have impressed and not so impressed, things that are going on with LeBron James, Luka Doncic, and lots more. So stay tuned for that. That podcast coming up in the next couple days on the Harrison Valley Podcast. Once again, thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time. See ya.